Hi everyone, this is Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein and together with ChessLecture.com I'd like to welcome you to today's lecture. Now today I want to show you very simple and effective way to punish white in the Coley system. So the Coley system is usually a very passive opening and very solid opening at the same time. After d4, knight of 6, knight of 3, e6, white plays this very passive move e3. Now the difference between the Coley and the London system, in the London system the bishop gets out to f4. This is actually much better opening because after e3 you don't lock that bishop up on c1. e3 however is very passive but nevertheless because of various reasons it has been popular recently. Sometimes people just want to avoid opening preparation, sometimes low rated player just wants to get a solid position against a GM like happened here in this game. I'm playing uh, strong master lawyer times and simply d5 and c5 so I actually start with a c5 move followed by knight c6 c3 d5. This setup these three pawns against these three pawns is what I recommend to everybody. Very simple straightforward way to play chess. So let's keep going. Knight bd2, bishop d6, both sides castle. And the whole problem here for white is lack of space. White is not fighting for opening advantage at all. White is just trying to develop. But the bishop on c1 is really poorly placed. My bishop on c8 is a little bit passive as well, but conceptually black could try to activate that bishop later on with e6, e5 pawn push, or sometimes even with the fan shadow bishop b6, bishop b7. So in this game, white tries to fight for the center right away after pawn takes, bishop takes, and this move e4. So far so good. Now white is saying, I'm going to play e5 potentially, maybe even checkmate you, and if you take me, I'm going to have a better end game, right? Because now this guy is now completely open, and this guy is passive. So this is basically the position White is trying to achieve. Now my advice to you is that as long as you are not afraid of the pawn push e5, you are completely fine. So what did I play? Very simple move, h6. I'm almost inviting white to play e5 because that pawn is going to be a liability rather than a strength. If he plays e5 right away, I have two possibilities, knight d7 or knight g4. Knight g4 is, of course, more aggressive, putting pressure on both pawns. Rook e1 is out of the question. Queen here, potentially queen c7 with a very nice position. So this is one way to play. Uh, more passive move knight d7 works just as well. Again, applying tons and tons of pressure against that pawn is how you're going to get counterplay. So I like knight g4 personally. So my pawn is kind of playing cat and mouse game. He says, I'm going to wait to play e5 in the most opportune moment. Because again, taking on e4 favors white. And I said, please do. I'm ready for it. My queen now guards the e5 square too. Again, e5 is going to be met by knight g4. My opponent plays g3. Again, continuing that cat and mouse game, but honestly, g3, when the bishop is not on g2, makes no sense to me. The king is vulnerable. So I play bishop b6. Why is this a useful move? Because the only way he can get that bishop out is to play knight b3, and I anticipate it. So this is a good waiting move. Again, he is playing the cat and mouse game, king g2, trying to improve his position. Rook e8, a very cunning move. Obviously, if he takes, I'm going to take with a pawn, and this queen on e2 feels really, really uncomfortable. Again, white has an opportunity to play e5 here, but my opponent is afraid of knight g4, and he plays h3. h3. e5, again, both knight g7 and knight g4 are possible. This is more active move. And again, rook e1 runs into problems on f2. So that's why he played h3. And now, cat and mouse game is pretty, pretty much done. I'm going to blow open the center with e5, exclam, 
and realize that white's pieces are so poorly placed, especially the bishop on c1, which will never enter the game anytime soon, and the rook on i1, that blowing open the game absolutely favors black. Now, believe it or not, from this position, white got completely losing position in a matter of five moves. Let me show you what happened next. He takes on d5. e4, look at this. Of course, I could simply take the pawn and be satisfied with a nice edge, but I decided to really sacrifice to open up the game using the pin on the e file. So he says, okay, I'm going to take the, the knight. Pawn takes, queen takes, queen takes c6. So let's pause for a moment. Now that the tactics are cleared up, we have a very clear position. Two bishops against bishop and knight, and white has an extra pawn. So does it mean that black just simply lost the pawn? No. Black has complete counterplay here, complete compensation, because this guy is weakened. There's a lot of pressure on this diagonal, and even the end game will not save white. So my opponent plays queen c4. I simply play bishop d7. He thinks he's going to go into an endgame off a pawn, but in reality, this endgame is absolutely disastrous for white because of this pin and the e2 square for my rook. The two bishops are simply monsters. If you ever want to see the power of two bishops, this position is a perfect example. So now white tries to bail out with knight b3, rook d8, knight d4. He says, yes, please, go ahead, take back your extra pawn and try to uh, try to win. Opposite color bishop endgame. I said, okay, I'm going to take once, but now I will not take your extra pawn. Instead, I come up with a much better move. So why don't you try to pause your video and ask yourself a question. What else can black do besides winning that pawn on d4? So if you need more time, go ahead and pause the video. And the answer is quite simple. Power play chess. Activate your rook. Rook e2, x clamp. Paralyzing white on the second rank. White says, please take at least the b pawn. I say, thanks, but no thanks. Rook d to e8. If you saw this idea, good job, because this is basically the winning move of the game. I think it's time for white to resign. Believe it or not, with a very simple threat, rook takes e3, white is completely lost. Notice the king can't move, the knight can't move, so white again tries to bail out with d5. Now I simply take with my knight, hitting the bishop with check. He takes on a7, and now a very cute sequence. Knight e3 check, offering my knight for free. Well, obviously because of this pin, it's not really a free knight. He plays king g1, but if he takes it, I was going to play rook a2 to, to e3. And this is a perfect picturesque position showing how bad things turned out for white. This game also in, illustrates to you one of the basic concepts, the power of the pin. Material is irrelevant when you have such a powerful pin. And the knight falls. So my opponent should have resigned probably. He tries this move, king g1, which is only going to lose more material. Knight takes f1, knight d4. This fork is really irrelevant when I have an extra rook, which I will have after the move rook e1. And finally, white resigns. For instance, rook takes, rook takes, knight takes, pawn takes. Extra rook, rook and knight versus bishop, easy win. These pawns are going to get picked up and won. So, again, just to go over the opening, you see how badly things turned out for white. So, after the following sequence, white achieves his aim. This is the coalition system, right? The bishop is locked up, though. Black simply plays central chess. I don't mind this position at all. Finally, white tries to open up the game, but very important, you don't take the pawn. You keep improving your position, and with the following improving moves, black made more useful moves than white. And with this power play move e5, I got a very nice position. I'm sure white could have defended better, but practically speaking, this is not the position 
you want to achieve as white. Big advantage, easy play, and I hope you're going to win a lot of nice games using this concept. Thank you very much. This was Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein for ChessLecture.com, and good luck to everyone.